Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. All right. It's first Sunday in October. Every October, we're going to have a Vision Sunday. This is a, a day to get realigned together as a body. It's a day to, to remind ourselves of what God, the vision that God has given this church, who we are. Um, you're, it's not going to be the same thing every time, but you will hear some of the same stuff every time. And I think it's okay. How many times did Jesus have to repeat things before his disciples got it, right? You, you, really, you really do have to say things over and over and over before you get it. We, I heard a story from Eric Johnson in Bethel Church in Reading. Um, I took a, a preaching course with him over Zoom, and something he said was whenever they first took over the church, what God put on their heart to, to kind of the vision for the church was community, God kept speaking community. And they said they, they would get up, he said they would get up every week, talk about community, they would preach about it, they would talk about it, they would pray about it, they'd put it in people's faces, they'd put it in their ears, community, 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 community. And he said for three years, people were just like, like it just, what, they weren't getting it. It just didn't make sense. But he said after three years of just constantly over and over and over and over, he said it just finally started clicking people started understanding, oh, this is who we are. This is what we're doing. And, and all of a sudden, you saw, you saw the people in that church. He said you could see the people begin to form a tight-knit community there of believers, and it wasn't you know, what they had seen before. So <clears throat> today, you will hear some stuff that you have heard before, but hopefully it's not boring for you. It's not boring for me ever. Uh, I love studying the word. I love getting revelation from the Lord and being able to share. It's one of my favorite things, probably better than I love sharing about the best movies that I've seen. You know, I, I just, I love sharing revelation from the Lord. I said probably, definitely more than that. Um, now, you know, sharing about my Chinese food experience is like a close second, but, you know, no, okay. All right, so today... What I want to do is I want to cast vision for us where God has us, where he has had us, where he's taking us. And I want to do it a little bit differently than what I've done in the past. I want to start out today by talking about me <clears throat> and my wife. She is in this. We are one, so me is Bailey, okay? Um, but everything that I'm about to say to you is... We are of one mind in this, and we both agree on these things. The reason I wanna talk about me is because I wanna tell you what kind of leader I desire to be, what kind of pastor I desire to be. And in telling you what kind of leader, what kind of pastor I desire to be, I'm hoping that that will actually set a foundation for where I believe God wants to take us. Because ultimately, how Bailey and I choose to lead this body is gonna be tied in with the direction that God wants us to go. Don't worry, I'm not gonna talk about me the whole time. Only like 10 minutes, I promise. <clears throat> but I don't think that I've ever shared this with you before. I don't think I've ever gotten up here and said, this is how I want to pastor. This is how I want to lead. And maybe when I say all of this, you're gonna be like, well, I've seen that last few years or a couple of years or even whenever we were associate pastors, you know, we've seen that, but hopefully this will enlighten you to kind of our heart and our vision, how we want to lead this body. So as pastors of Living Word, we have every intention of shepherding this body. That's what we, that's what we intend to do. We have been doing it, We've been doing it, and we have every intention to keep on doing it, okay? God's put us in a position of 
as a shepherd of this body, that's who we want to be. But <clears throat> we never want to be shepherds that enable sheep to stay sheep. Okay? We're not going to be those kind of shepherds. I'm sorry. If you're coming to this church and you, you're coming to this church as a sheep and you want to stay a sheep forever, you will be very disappointed because we will challenge you, we will call you higher, we will call you to greater places of responsibility than a sheep can handle. So if you come here and you wanna stay a sheep forever, I'll, I will just say flat out, I think you're in the wrong place. Because if you come here, know that you will be called to a greater level, a higher level than the sheep can handle. I think that, well, I know that there are a lot of people who just want to be sheep. They just want to find a nice old mega church that they can sit in the back row of and just kind of consume and eat and be fed and made feel better and go home and sleep. And that's it. And there's no change made, there's no transformation of character, there's no pursuit of something more, it's just, just give me what I want, make me feel good, and then I'm gonna leave. I know that there are a lot of believers like that. But as the pastors of Living Word, my wife and I want to tell you and call you to a place of understanding that is not what Jesus has called us to do. Not one bit. That is not the example that he has set for us. That is not the church that he is building and that he has built. Amen? Amen. Okay, so just, I haven't seen anybody leave, so apparently you're all here. You know that, that you're gonna be challenged, you're gonna be called higher, and you can't stay a sheep forever. <clears throat> I think, I would assume that there are pastors in the world, and I think that I have encountered pastors in my own lifetime, who are okay with their bodies staying sheep forever. Because it helps the pastor to control things. It helps the pastor to maintain control, okay? I don't wanna give away my secrets of studying the Bible. I don't wanna give my, away my secrets of how I live my life with God. I don't wanna tell you, you know, those kind of things because I want you to depend on me for your salvation. I know there are pastors in the world like that. We are not that, that way, okay? I will always say, if you are relying on me, I promise you, I'm not gonna take you the right direction because I'm just a person. You have to rely on Jesus, only him. Your relationship is actually not with me, it's with him, amen? I think that's why <clears throat> Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Notice how he didn't say, follow me as I follow Christ. He said, do what I do, do what I do. He didn't say, sit under me. <clears throat> he didn't say, obey me. He said, do what I do. Paul was a leader, right? He was a leader. He was an apostle. He was in charge of a lot of things. God gave him a lot of responsibility. And instead of saying, be my sheep, or sit under me, or obey me, he said, do what I do. Well, if you're doing what Paul's doing, and Paul's doing what Jesus is doing, then you're gonna be doing exactly, you're gonna, you're gonna look like Paul. Your life is gonna look like his and therefore your life is gonna look like Jesus. And guess what? Paul and Jesus didn't just sit there. They didn't. They didn't just sit there. They did what they could. They carried, well, number one, they allowed themselves to be transformed. Uh, obviously, I can't say they. Jesus, from the moment he was born, obviously, hit the human part of him he allowed to be fully submitted to the Father, right? But that was the example that he set for us, that he set for Paul, and Paul says, imitate me as I imitate him, right? So if you're in here, just know that that is where you'll be called to. <clears throat> you'll be called to acknowledge the responsibility that you have to steward the gift of salvation. Yes, the gift of salvation is a gift, it's a free gift, and it's an incredible gift. 
But every gift requires stewardship. Amen? I'm glad Nate is listening to me. All right, turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, and I want to start with verse 35. Matthew 9, 35. It says, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And then verse one of chapter 10 says, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. I wanna paint this picture for you. Jesus, the shepherd, the shepherd, capital T-H-E, capital S, the shepherd looks at the people that are following them. And he, he has this groaning in his gut. It, I mean, whenever it says that he felt compassion, it literally means his bowels turned. This is how deeply it caused him discomfort. He looked at them and he, he felt in his heart that they were like sheep without a shepherd. The shepherd <clears throat> thought that. He's the shepherd, right? Yeah? The shepherd looks at these people. He says, they're like sheep without a shepherd, or he thinks that. And then he turns around to his disciples, and he says, pray for laborers. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray for laborers. These people need a shepherd. There's something in there. Jesus did not raise his disciples to be followers. If he looks out at these people, and he sees them as sheep without a shepherd, and then he looks back at his disciples and he says, pray for laborers. I think that there's an implication there that he's making toward his disciples. Hey, I want you to shepherd them. I want you to shepherd them. Jesus, the shepherd, didn't raise his disciples to be sheep. He raised them to be shepherds in every way. In his instruction, in his example, in his leadership, he did not raise them to be sheep. He raised them to be shepherds. How many in here are a disciple of Jesus? You aren't being raised to be a sheep. If you are being raised to be a sheep by a person, you aren't being raised by Jesus because he's not gonna raise you to be a sheep. He raises shepherds, amen? He doesn't raise kids, he raises adults. He does. He said these people need shepherds, or he thought that, and then he immediately turns his turns around and gives his disciples authority. Now, this is, this is so interesting to me. I love this, and, and you may have heard me say this before, but I, I love what happens here because he looks out and he sees these people need somebody. They need laborers. They need people to take care of them, right? They need people to take care of them. And he turns around to his disciples and he says, pray for laborers. He says, pray for laborers because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And then in verse one of chapter 10, he gives them authority. In that moment, they become apostles. He gives them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every kind of sickness and disease. What do you think happened between the last verse of chapter nine and the first verse of chapter 10? Because he turns around to his disciples and says, pray that the Lord would send laborers into the harvest. And then all of a sudden, he's making laborers out of his disciples by giving them authority to go and do the things that were needed by these people. 
I think between verse 38 of chapter nine and verse one of chapter 10, something happened with the disciples. I think when Jesus turned around to his disciples and said, hey, I want you to pray that God would send laborers into the harvest, I can't, I'm, I'm thinking this is what happened. The disciples said, what about us? <clears throat> hey, how about instead of praying, we would just do it? How about you send us out there? And then it says, Jesus summoned his disciples and gave them authority. Isn't that amazing? He didn't force that on them. I guarantee you he didn't force that on them. I guarantee you he said, hey, how about you pray? And they said, well, how about we just do it? What do we need to do? And he says, well, here's the authority. Go heal sickness, go heal disease, go cast out unclean spirits. You got everything you need. He didn't raise his disciples to be sheep. He raised them to be shepherds. In Matthew chapter 14, this is how intense it got. Matthew chapter 14, you don't have to turn there. If you don't want to, you can if you want to. In Matthew chapter 14, you have the huge crowd of people that came to hear Jesus teach. This is a famous story of when the 5,000 fed, when in reality, it says 5,000 men. So there is definitely a lot more than that, okay? This huge miracle, we know that whole story, but in Matthew chapter 14, you know what, you know what happens? All the people are coming, it's been a really long day, and it's starting to get late, and the disciples say, hey, it's getting late, and these people are hungry, maybe we should send them home so they can eat. And Jesus says, how about you feed them instead? He says, how about you feed them instead? How about you do that? Did he say, don't worry, I'll feed them? Listen, a good leader doesn't say, don't worry, I'll do it. A good leader says, hey, you do it. This is the kind of leader Jesus was. This is how much he wanted them to become shepherds themselves. You do it. You feed them. We don't need to send them home. Keep them here. Why do you think more people come to church on Sundays when you say you're going to have food? <laughs> Jesus knew what's up. He said, if you just feed them right now, they'll stay. He knew. He knows the secret to growing churches. Right? Can you imagine if we had a picnic every Sunday, how big our church would be? Anyway. Jesus literally did not want his disciples relying on him at all. Now, when I say they didn't, he didn't want them relying on him, I don't mean that it, he didn't want them placing their trust in him. But they, he didn't want them to use him as a crutch for something that they've already been given authority to do. We just read four chapters ago, he gave them authority. And now they're acting like they don't have any. He said, I, I gave you authority to do stuff like this. You should do it. You feed them. And I'll tell you right now, as pastors, I guarantee you, me and Bailey, this is how we'll be. You come to us, you know, you, you, you tell us about a problem you're facing, an issue, issue you're facing. Trust me, we are going to fight for peace. We're going to fight for comfort. We are going to pray with you. We are going to do, we're going to love on you. We're going to do all of that. But don't be surprised if we say, hey, you feed them. Don't be surprised if we say to you, hey, you have what you need for this situation. You have everything you need. Way too many believers who are just like laying on the ground, letting life beat them up. They continue laying there. They continue getting kicked around, beat around by life. And the answer actually is not in the comfort that comes from your pastor. It's in your relationship with Jesus, yours. It's in yours. And my relationship with Jesus is not your relationship with Jesus. I may be growing in, my, in my, my spiritual walk with Jesus. I may be growing in my relationship, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're growing. That's up to you. Amen? <clears throat> so don't be surprised if, you know, we'll, we'll help however we can. And you guys know that. You guys know what kind of people we are. We're not gonna just say, you can handle it yourself. We're not like that. 
But don't be surprised if that doesn't come up in convers- or if that comes up in conversation because it probably will most of the time. Jesus was so intent upon his disciples becoming leaders that he only spent three years with them before just taking off. He spends three years with his disciples. It's three years, guys, three years. Some of us struggle building ministries in 10, in 20. He spends three years with his disciples, and then he says, your turn. I'm leaving. And it was such a shock to them that when he floated up into the clouds and even they couldn't see him anymore, it was such a shock to them that they just continued to look up into the clouds. And we don't read about how long they looked, but it was long enough for God to send an angel down (laughs) and be like, hey, snap out of it. He's going to come back the same way that he left, (laughs) right? It must have been long. You know how non-intelligent you look when you're (laughs) doing that? (laughs) Jesus says, hey, I've given you authority over everything. I'm going to be with you always to the very end of the age. Take this to the ends of the earth. Bye. They're just going to, (laughs) oh. He wasn't really being serious, was he? Like he's... He's just pranking us. Jesus, you're just pranking us right now, right? You're actually, you're not leaving, right? Because we, you don't really think we can do this, right? (laughs) You know how many times I hear believers say, I don't think I can do that. This is a picture of a believer who doesn't think they can do what Jesus has told them to do. (laughs) This is why we have so many end timers Just believers waiting on Jesus to come back. This is why. Like I said, it had to be long enough for God, because God eventually had to send an angel to get him to snap out of it. Listen, Jesus literally just told you what you have to do. He wasn't joking about leaving. It's up to you now. He spends three years with them, puts it in their hands, and then he's out. You won't recognize a great leader by the way they enter. You'll recognize a great leader by the way they exit. What happens after they exit? That's how you know whether they were a good leader. It's not found in title, position, honor, glory. It's not found in that. In fact, this is why we celebrate so many people who are dead and we actually don't celebrate them while they're alive. Because we don't realize just how good of a leader they were until they're gone. Because that's where the proof is. I don't want the legacy that we are carrying to go to the grave with us. It needs to be put into the hands of the people who follow us. And if the people who follow us can't carry that legacy, then we weren't doing a very good job of leading. I'm not speaking against ministers who die in the pulpit, but I think this is why I disagree with dying in the pulpit. Just, I'm gonna stay here until my very last breath. Because if there's nobody there, if you haven't raised somebody up to take that place, to take that position, and to continue to carry that, then what was it all for? Jesus realized What will this all be for if I don't raise up 12 men who walk like me, look like me, talk like me, act like me, think like me? What will this all be for? I need to carry this on so that even after I'm gone, there are people here who can continue what I've started. Amen? So all of this, all of what I've been saying comes around to one thing. One thing, it's two words, and I bring it up all the time. All of this, 
is about personal growth. Personal growth. I'm not talking about church growth. I'm not talking about getting as many people as we can in here to make sure we have a big church, make us feel good when we're on stage preaching to 500 people instead of 50. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about big people. I'm talking about growing as individuals, growing as believers, as people. This is the heartbeat of who we are as a church. I will say this every year. Our number one goal is personal growth. Now, obviously, you know, you think, well, what about Jesus? Well, that, he's involved in that. You can't grow without him. You can't grow outside of a relationship with him. You can't grow out of it, outside of intimacy with him. That's where personal growth happens. But here's the deal. The key to personal growth is actually not in the second word, growth. It's actually in the first, gro- first word, personal. It's yours. It's your growth. You. It's on you. It's not on me. It's not on the leadership. It's on you. It's personal. How are you going to grow personally? How are you going to grow in secret by yourself? Personal growth is personal. It's not up to my pastor. It's not up to my teacher. It's not up to the person praying for me. It's up to me and my relationship with Jesus. I guarantee you there are a lot of believers, I guarantee it, who feel strong with the Lord when their prayers get answered. They feel like their relationship with Jesus is strong whenever their prayers get answered. But that doesn't say anything about your relationship with Jesus. That just says something about Jesus. I call somebody, hey, I have this prayer request. Can you pray for me? Sure, I'll pray for you. That's not a relationship with Jesus. Just doing that, that's a relationship with prayer. That's a relationship with healing. That's a relationship with provision. But we need to have a personal relationship with Jesus, the healer, the provider. Amen? Those are the most those common things. It's sickness and lack. Sickness and lack. Those are the most common issues among believers. Sickness and lack. I need you to pray for healing. I need you to pray for provision. The reason I'm bringing this up is because a lot of the time, I think people will ask for, for someone to pray for them before they've prayed themselves. And I kind of want to maybe get into the habit of like when somebody asks me, can you pray for me? Ask them, have you prayed yet? It's not that I won't pray for you. The word says, are there any sick among you? Call for the elders of the church to come and lay hands on you and pray for you. But the word also says, pray without ceasing. It doesn't say ask for somebody to pray for you without ceasing. It's, some, it's a call to us, right? The word is literally saying, hey, how about you talk to God instead of only asking somebody else to talk to him for you, right? And that should be a sign to us of where our relationship with Jesus is. Let me tell you, if our relationship with Jesus is suffering, it's never on him, ever. It is never on him. It is on us, amen? That's where personal growth comes into play. Personal growth is me asking this question every single day. How can I allow Jesus to influence my life today? Every single day, how can I let his character, his thinking, thought processes, his words, his actions, how can I let him influence me today? How can I let him transform me today? Personal growth is so amazing that whatever situation you may be facing, whatever you're going through, it can be the worst thing you've ever faced and you can feel like a defeat is coming. You're like, this is terrible. Like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I've never experienced anything like this. This is painful. This is uncomfortable. You can take any situation you want and walk out of it victorious because you've grown. There is no victory that is greater than growth. And if you, I'm telling you, if you pursue that in every situation that you face, you will never feel defeated, ever. 
somebody that's really mad at you or mean to you or saying mean things to you. It may be really hard to, to have a relationship with them, right? And you may think, well, you know, nah, I don't know what to do about this situation. This person stinks. And listen, we've all been there. I understand. But you can take that person in that situation that you're facing and you could be like, how can I benefit from this? There's literally something there that I can benefit from. Whether this relationship ends up surviving, whether it grows, whether it prospers, I can actually benefit from this. So I'm gonna be selfish <laughs> and actually just grow myself, even if the other person doesn't know about it. All kinds of things that we can face, no matter what we face. Listen, you can be in a furnace burning Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You can be in a furnace burning and come out of there completely unscathed. Completely unscathed. I didn't think I was gonna bring this up today, but James talks about counting it all joy when you face trials of many kinds. Count it all joy. You know what he's literally saying? Your trials are the cause for your joy. <clears throat> did he say the outcome of your trials is the cause for your joy, or did he say the trials themselves are the cause for your joy? And you know what he says? He says, because the trials produce in you endurance. And endurance, if you let it have its perfect result, will make you complete and perfect. He's saying, listen, if you want to be happy, this is the key to happiness right here. Go through some trials and allow it to produce endurance in you because that will make you, that will make your character and that will build you into a person that looks like Jesus. That's the key to happiness right there. <clears throat> and it's funny because that word endurance means to remain under it re to remain under. Well, to remain under what? To remain under trial. The more trials you face, the more strength you have to face the next one. The more strength you have to face the one after that, the stronger you get if you allow endurance to be produced in you, if you allow your character to develop through that. Now, here's the deal. Even though Jesus was raising his disciples to be leaders, even though he was raising them to be shepherds, he was not raising ministers, okay? We think that's the heartbeat of the gospel right there. The heartbeat of the gospel is go out into all the world. No, that's the result of the gospel. That's the fruit of the gospel. The heartbeat of the gospel is you changed, me changed because of Jesus. That's the gospel right there. Jesus was not raising his disciples to be ministers. He was raising them to be sons of God, men of God. And I wanna say something about ministry. It cannot be used as a cover-up for bad character. And it is. We think this is something new but Jesus actually talked about it whenever he was walking on this earth because he says, there'll be many that come to me on that day saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we perform all these miracles? Didn't we prophesy in your name? And Jesus will still say, depart from me, I never knew you. What does that tell us? You know, we can justify ministry you know, forsaking character from ministry, we can justify it by saying, well, Paul said, well, at least they're preaching the gospel. That's what matters the most. Well, yeah, I'm glad that's happening, but do you think Jesus is up there going, well, Josh really doesn't love me, but at least he's preaching the gospel. No, his heart is broken for me. Well, Josh isn't really following me, but at least he's preaching the gospel. At least he's doing some evangelism. That's good. No, he's, his heart is broken for me. This is why he said that. Now, what's so amazing about
What's so amazing about what Jesus says whenever he says the people that would come to him on, on their day and say, didn't we do all this stuff in your name? He's literally giving us the key right there. That our life is, is not supposed to be about what we do. Not at all. What's crazy is we get so focused on not doing bad, we think that life is about doing good, doing good things. We're so focused on not doing bad. It's not at all what life is about. It's not about doing, period. It's not about doing. It's about being. It's about becoming. It's about being transformed. It's not about what the image does. It's about the image itself. Amen? You don't have to turn there just for the sake of time, but Matthew chapter seven, verses 15 through 16. Matthew seven fifteen through 16. It says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? What he's saying right here, obviously he's talking about false prophets, but there is a, a general statement that he's making here about what people of God look like. He's saying you know somebody by their fruits, just as you know a tree by its fruits, just as you know a vine by its fruits. We've talked about this before. You'll never see an apple tree that has oranges on it, right? You're never gonna see a grapevine that has olives on it. It doesn't work that way. You're going to know the tree by its fruit. So what does the fruit do? You see, often what we do is we call fruitfulness action. We call fruitfulness works. I'm not being very fruitful right now. I'm not bearing fruit right now. I'm not doing things, fruitful things for God's kingdom. My life for God's kingdom is not very fruitful. Fruitfulness is not about what we do because what, what he's saying right here about the false prophets and knowing them by their fruits is this. You're going to know what their source is who their source is by their fruit. The fruit is always going to reveal who they are. It's always going to reveal where their roots are. It's always going to reveal what kind of tree they are, what kind of vine they are. It's not talking about works here. We're actually talking about character. You see, whenever, they, whenever the high priest, they saw Peter and John after they ministered to the lame guy at the beautiful gate, when they saw him, them, they noticed they had been with Jesus. They could tell they've been with Jesus. Why? It wasn't because of what they did, I promise you. They just looked at them and they, they, they saw Jesus all over them. They looked like him, they talked like him, they walked like him, they could see, they could tell they were thinking like them. They're like, those people belong to Jesus right there. They were bearing fruit. It wasn't because of the miracle, it was because of who they were, who they had become. And their fruit was actually exposing them to people who didn't like Jesus. We could tell, they said we could tell they had been with Jesus. They could tell. It was based on their fruit. The fruit is always going to reveal my source, my fruit is not what I do, it's what I look like, it's who I am. That's what fruitfulness is. And what's crazy is he says, you will know them by their fruits, and then elsewhere he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He says, I never knew you. And before that, he says, you will know them by their fruits. If on that day we approach Jesus and we think we can get away with telling him about everything that we did for him and that's gonna get us into heaven, that's a big old X. Nope, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna work. 
What about all those other people that I got into heaven? That's great, but you're not getting in. Because I don't know you. You led all those people to Jesus? They know me, but you don't know me. Yeah, but I did that. I should get credit for that. That's not what this is about. The heartbeat of the gospel is not about my ministry. Jesus is not raising ministers. He's raising sons and daughters of God. He's raising sons and daughters of God. And that takes a lot of molding. It takes a lot of testing. It takes a lot of fire going around you, all the trials you walk through. It takes a lot of work to make me into who Jesus desires to make me, to make me into that person. I'm telling you, this is the heartbeat of the vision for our church. I don't know what to tell you if you are not strengthening your own relationship with Jesus. I don't know what to tell you if you feel like this place is just a hospital where you can get free healing and free money and free everything. That is not what this is. Jesus did not build his church on a pillow. He built it on a rock. This is a hard place, you guys. This is not a comfortable place. We are built on a rock. Amen? Amen. We are not meant to be comfortable. He said... These people coming up to him saying, hey, can I follow you, Jesus? And he basically says, are you sure? Are you sure you want to do this? Because I don't have anywhere to lay my head. So you may not want to do this. I'm telling you right now, guys, if you're choosing this path, there's nowhere to lay your head. This life isn't about comfort. But I'm telling you this too. The happiest you'll ever be is when you pursue this kind of life. One that's after the transformation of character that's found in Jesus Christ in a solid relationship with him. It's so amazing because when he asked his disciples, who who do people say the son of man is? They say, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're other prophets. And then he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter looks at him and he says, you're Jesus Christ, the son of God. And Jesus looks at Peter and he says, congratulations. Literally, you know when he says, blessed are you, Simon? It means congratulations. Nobody told you that but God. Are we in a place, ask yourself this, are you in a place where the revelation of God that you have is not something your pastor told you, but something God told you? Is your revelation of God based on the sermon you listened to last week from a pastor, a minister you've never met before? Or is it based on your personal communion and time with God? And he poured this into you. Will Jesus be able to look at you on that day and say, congratulations, nobody told you those things except for the Father. Is that where you're at? Ask yourself that question. That is who we are as as Living Word Church. That is our vision. That is growth, and that is what we want. We aren't raising sheep. We are raising strong, mighty people, men and women of God, sons and daughters of God, who can take care of themselves and take care of their own relationship with Jesus. That's who we're raising. That is who we want to be. Amen? And one last thing. All all of this up here. Listen, Listen, you might not end up on this stage. I don't even know if I want to be up here anymore. You might not end up up here and you might think, well, God's not, I'm not where I'm supposed to be. God's not doing what I'm supposed to, or you know, what he's called me to do. He's not doing that in me. You may think, well, Jesus, you know, he he raised his disciples to be leaders. He raised them to be shepherds and I'm going to go start a church. That's what I'm going to go do, right? 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and start a church. I'm gonna go pastor a church somewhere. Listen, I really don't like just starting churches for whatever. Like, start a church if there's a need, but don't start a church because you have a need. I don't want that, guys. I've seen too many people go off and start churches because they don't like where they're at and they think they can fulfill their desires by starting a church somewhere else that plays by their rules. That's not what we want. This is not your goal. That's your goal right there. That's your goal. He is my goal. He is my goal. Out there is not my goal. The miracles that I can perform through Jesus, the prayers, the laying on of hands, whatever you want to call it, the people I can lead to Jesus, that's not my goal. That's not. Fruitfulness in the kingdom of God is not the result of obedience. In other words, I'm not fruitful just because I listened to God tell me to go pray for somebody and I prayed for them and they were healed. That is not fruitfulness. Fruitfulness is not the result of obedience. It is obedience. Fruit, a fruitful person in the kingdom of God, someone who bears fruit for the kingdom of God is not somebody who does things. It is somebody who is someone. It is somebody who just says yes to Jesus. Period. Yes, 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 I'll do it. Yes, yes, I'll be that. I'll go that direction. Yes, that's what it is. That's who we're gonna be as people, amen? And I kinda wanna like just take a sledgehammer to this thing. I'm kinda tired of, I'm honestly tired of, of the picture that this paints. I don't want any, any separation, any division, or people thinking that this is the person you need to rely on. I don't want that at all. So let's just not do that. Have I repeated it enough? Well, you didn't have to say yes, because I wanted to keep going. But. Why don't you stand with me? Do we, have a, do we have a habit of coming in here empty? Empty? Hungry? I'm not saying hungry like we want more. I'm saying hungry like we need more. Like we haven't been given enough, like we aren't filled. The Bible says that we've been filled with the fullness of God. We've been filled with the fullness because in Jesus was the fullness of God and Jesus is in us. We have the fullness of God. We can no longer come to this place empty. We can no longer come to this place lacking in need of something. This place is for full people. It's for full people. Because the only way that Jesus can properly build his church is when all of its members are working together, when all of its members are participating, when all of its members are coming with something to bring. This is why the church started the way that it did. It said they all brought something. Why did they all bring something? Because they all had something. They were all taking care of themselves outside of that gathering. They weren't coming to get something. They were coming to give something. That's why, that's why they did it. Jesus didn't give them instruction to do that. It was just so natural. I'm here to give something because I have something. Amen? And every time we walk in here, the person sitting next to you or the person sitting in front of you or whatever, you have something for them. You do. We all do. We got to take care of ourselves, guys. This is a military base. It's not a hospital. It's not a restaurant. It's a military base. Amen? Can we just lay our crowns down on the floor today? Can we just submit to Jesus, submit to him, and just literally, let's place ourselves in a place of just giving him what he is due right now. Can we loose our lips and just begin to worship him? 
Jesus, we love you, we worship you, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you, we glorify you, we exalt you, Jesus. You are worthy, you are holy, you are beautiful, you are glorious, you are incredible, you are wonderful, you are amazing. Father, teach us to recognize what we have inside of us. Teach us to recognize who we are in you. Teach us to recognize who you have called us to be. Teach us how to steward the gift of salvation. Teach us how to steward the gift of forgiveness. Teach us how to steward the gift of joy. Teach us how to steward the gift of peace. Teach us, Lord. Teach us to steward the gift of kindness and love. What you have given us. May we be a people who who operate and function from a place of giftedness and not lack, of fullness and not emptiness. May we rely on you totally. I'm gonna say right now, the word actually talks about placing your trust in people. The word trust meaning your total dependence and reliance. Leaning on a person will just make you end up in a desert alone by yourself. You know why that is? It's because nobody can handle your weight but Jesus. You are too heavy for everyone but him. All of your burdens, all of the weight, all of that stuff on you, it's too heavy for people. I'm telling you as your pastor, I can't take it. Like, I'll help you as I can, but I am not here to be a wall that you can lean on. I wanna show you who you can lean on. I wanna show you that he can bear your weight. He can bear your burdens. He can bear it all. He can take it all. He wants it all. Don't feel like you have to reluctantly give give him your burdens because he actually wants them. He's up there saying, give them to me. I want to relieve you of these things. I want to relieve you of these struggles, of these problems. Give them to me. I want to heal that sickness. I want to fill your bank account. I want to put food on your plate. Give me those things. Leave it up to me. Let me be your God. Let me be your savior. Let me be your rock. Build yourself on me. And watch how beautifully I can build you. Watch how wonderful I can make you. Jesus said to Peter, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. If Jesus is not the one building you, the gates of hell, the gates of hell will prevail over you. He has to be the one building you. He has to be the one constructing you. So let's ask him that. Jesus, can you just, can you build us? You build us. You build us up. You you pour into us. You be our savior. You be our God. You be our leader. You be our king. We submit to you. We submit to your authority and to your leadership. We ask that you just take us. Just take us wherever you want to go. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.